Hello. Is it? Are there going to be pitches here, or is this a booth? There will be pitches here in just okay. a. Yep. We're just waiting for everyone to trickle in, and then we'll be getting started with the pitches. And <sighs> Brad Force just want to give you a heads up that you will be the first to go. Um, and then after Brad Force, we have Periscope. All right. Probably give a, another sixty seconds um, for people to find their way to this booth. Um, just as a reminder. This is the, um, there are two booths. This one is on health tech, sensing, and comps. So if that's what you're in interested in, you are in the right place. If you're looking for energy, materials, and maintenance, um, that is in the other room. And in which case, you know, please feel free to log out of this one, um, exit the Zoom meeting, and go to the other room and join that Zoom meeting. Right. All right, I think we are go, good to go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Maxwell. Today you'll be hearing six more pitches after the six pitches you just heard. Um, very excited to hear all of them. Uh, just as a reminder to our companies, um, I will be holding up signs that say one minute warning and stop. If you are not a company that's presenting, you see the sign, do not worry. Um, have no fear. This is for the person who is speaking. Um, and so we'll do our best to stick to the five minutes so that everyone has plenty of time afterwards to go and talk to these companies after uh, in their booths. As a reminder, there is no Q&A. Um, so please hold all your questions, um, either directly message them or go visit them in their booths. So are there any questions before we officially get started? Um, I know Tommy is really excited. Um, is already starting to pull up his, his PowerPoint there? Awesome. All right. In that case, um, Let's uh, sorry, let me just and okay. Um, all right, I just muted everyone. So, Tommy, go ahead and unmute yourself, share your deck, and get started whenever you are. Now you can hear me, I think. Yep, I can hear you, and we can see. All right. Well, I uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here to talk about uh, this technology we're developing called Breath Force. Uh, so respiratory and cardiovascular deficits, uh, especially in cases of spinal cord injury, account for 56% of all deaths. It's actually the leading cause of morbidity, morbidity and mortality in these patients. It's actually associated with several comorbidities, including heart failure, COPD, and sleep disordered breathing. And if we kind of uh, open an umbrella under these deficits and just extend it to and call it respiratory dysfunction, you can actually, re excuse me, reach beyond spinal cord injuries, which there are about 18,000 per year in the U.S. to sleep apnea, 200,000 new cases per year in the U.S. Uh, COPD is 15 million people in the U.S. living with COPD. And then stroke patients, 795,000 strokes per year and a great majority of those actually uh, result in some respiratory dysfunction. If we think about this for active military and veterans, uh, the CDMRP is very interested in a few of these respiratory dysfunction, uh, particularly COPD, uh, for increased risk for some of the jobs that these military folks uh, do. And then for spinal cord injury, actually military of those 18,000, uh, military is actually eight times uh, the risk factor uh, compared to civilians. So what we see this as kind of a, an, unmet, an unmet clinical need regarding technology to optimize respiratory and cardiovascular training. Uh, and, and we have shown, our research shows that respiratory muscle training is one mechanism to do therapy for these patients has shown to be clinically effective in preventing respiratory and cardiovascular failure uh, in these patients. Um, there is existing technology. Most of it's crude and accurate. Uh, some are still bag-based. There's very, uh, very uh, limited options for uh, end users, home users to get any feedback at all. Clinical units are very expensive. Uh, most of them only provide resistance for either inhalation or exhalation, and there's no feedback. So the patients don't get feedback while they're doing the, their therapy. 
uh, or their training and unless you're in the clinic and the clinicians also want this data. So our solution has been to combine both inspiratory and expiratory training in one unit. Uh, our software and hardware enables this clinically developed and validated protocol. Uh, the device is portable, so we actually can send these home with patients and uh, it provides this data. So immediate feedback during use and then saving the data and providing this to clinicians to kind of track improvement. Uh, we see you know, respiratory care has a huge market. It's, it's increased dramatically, of course, since COVID, uh, up, increasing to over $31 billion in 2024. Uh, but we don't see this just for uh, respiratory defects, but we actually see many applications to this technology beyond COPD and SEI for potentially for active duty and military civilians to improve respiratory performance and cardiovascular function. Uh, we have two, uh, one patent that's pending, one that's going to fall, uh, that's going to drop this fall, both of our international patents. Our first prototype is actually in use at Fraser Rehab, has been since 2018. Our second prototype is uh, in development. We should have it ready by the end of the fall. And, and we see this as a technology readiness level of about seven or eight. Uh, our FDA strategy is 510K in the next 12 to 24 months based on history of predicate devices. And there are plenty of PC, uh, CPT codes for reimbursements, um, all the way from COPD and, of course, to general respiratory care. Uh, our development status, uh, we've been supported by the, I the local i program, uh, UofL Innovation Grant, and, of course, we're, participating, we're glad to be participating in this uh, program this summer through Ensign. And uh, we're developing a five-year validation study through the NIH, so we're not funded yet, but we're very hopeful. And uh, we have a local partner, uh, Power Neuro Recovery, who has commercialized some other uh, rehabilitation technology that we've developed at the university. So we see them as our, our, our quick go-to um, development partner. Uh, this is our team. I'm a bioengineer. We have a clinical, Alex Ovechkin is on the clinical side, and we have a project manager that's actually interacting with the patients and getting feedback. Uh, this is a collaboration between Fraser Rehab, Rehab Rehabilitation Institute and uh, the Speed School of Engineering and KSERC. And we're happy to talk more about licensing or maybe industrial partnering for scale up. So we'll see you in our booth and we appreciate the opportunity. Awesome, thank you very much, Tommy. Um, as a reminder, if you're interested in um, the tech from BreathForce, please check them out at their booth. Um, all right, next up we have Tara Spatio and then Gabriella, you are on deck. So you're coming up next. Uh, everyone see me okay? Yep. Great. Hello everyone. I'm Cormac Conrad, co-founder and CEO of Terra Spatial. We are building AI infused 5G millimeter wave system solutions. Some of the major pain points in today's communications technology are how to achieve reliable, resilient, secure, and flexible to deploy solutions relevant to both the commercial and the, and the military sector. For example, use cases like this for very, very dense environments, people uploading and downloading videos in, in train stations and stadiums, as well as the, the necessity to, to deploy infrastructure, for example, fiber, to achieve long range wireless links with all of the cost and construction, overhead and licensing. As I mentioned, similar pain points and use cases addressed for the DoD and US government. Our focus is where advanced wireless hardware meets AI machine learning software. Now, millimeter wave, as many of you know, is a new paradigm in large scale wireless networks. The frequencies are these frequencies here. The wavelength is very small. It's applicable to 5G and even 6G. And based on the wavelength, you can have very compact antenna arrays, really taking advantage of the spatial domain. But the solutions are still in relative infancy. Our two differentiated technology foundations are first, RF wireless silicon and hardware and AI machine learning algorithms applied to the radio layer. In particular, we are bringing to market advanced beamforming architectures in CMOS with very advanced capabilities, giving up to four times better capacity as well as advanced architectures. And second, applying AI machine learning right down at the radio RF physical layer to make the performance more agile and flexible and adjustable to a given environment. Our vision is to combine these two technologies and to deliver what we're calling AI-infused millimeter wave subsystems with up to 10 times the performance of a current state of the art. 
Uh, there's many broad applications and use cases, for example, private enterprise 5G, point to multipoint front, front hall, as I mentioned, avoiding the necessity for deploying fiber. We are building on more than 16 years of combined research at leading edge uni universities. First, from Carnegie Mellon, our co-founder and CTO, Professor Janet Paramesh, who's worked for more than 12 years with his group on advanced CMOS millimeter wave integrated circuits, hardware systems, advanced capabilities like beam forming, digital and hybrid beam forming, multi-band and full duplex algorithms, as well as many advanced, pretty far along silicon prototypes already presented at leading conferences and tested and demonstrated in the lab to work with system performance. And second, from Arizona State, our co-founder and chief scientist, Professor Ahmed Al-Khatib, who's been working on the application of AI and machine learning to the wireless physical layer. And we have an example, a real-time video of this. This setup uh, it shows an example of artificial intelligence applied to make a secure wireless link more robust. So this shows a transmitter here, which could be a user. And this represents a receiver, which could be, for example, a base station. And we also have an interferer which could be another base station or even potentially a hostile jammer trying to kind of jam your system. Now, in a typical 5G millimeter wave base station, the, the beam is coming from a, a predefined code book of, of, of possible beams. And it, 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 it does a beam sweeping to align with the direction of the desired transmitter and figure out the best setting from this predefined code book. And in this case, it gives, gives a data rate of about 1.9 gigabit per second. Now, once we turn on the jammer here at the interferer and we do the same beam sweeping or beam searching, of course, the performance is going to be degraded. It picks the best beam from the code book and we get, you see here, about 0.6 gigabit per second. Now, using the terraspatial AI beam learning technology, we can learn an optimized beam to mitigate the impact of that transmitter. So once we start the AI learning here, you can see that there's a, AI algorithms are, are, are operating. There's no knowledge needed about the wireless channel or about the interference properties. And we have res result in a, in, a, in, a, in a solution of 1.6 gigabit per second, which is more than 2.5 times the baseline solution. So you can see applying AI machine learning right down at the physical layer at the radio level can give a solution that's very optimized for the specific environment and use case. Our team has a combination of industrial and academic background uh, 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 broadly more than 80 years of combined experience in wireless semiconductor technology, R&D and, 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 and product commercialization. And we are looking for early adopter customers and partners in the DoD ecosystem and supplier ecosystem who would like to engage with us to help solve many critical 5G communications problems in that domain. Thank you and look forward to talking to you later. All right, thank you very much. Um, cool, next up we have Gabriella and Chemical Earmuffs, you are on deck. Whenever you're ready. Uh, can everyone see my screen and hear, hear me? Yep. Hi, uh, my name is Pravin Tilpatur. Uh, I'm a PhD student at University of Central Florida and um, I will be presenting the technology that we have developed for real-time active detection security videos and it's named Gabriella. Motivate the motivate the need for the technology. I'm showing you here a real time setup of a CCTV uh, camera system, uh, where there are multiple uh, camera feeds coming uh, coming to the to these monitors. And uh, uh, in in the in current setting, a person would be sitting in in front of such a system and looking at these camera feeds uh, to detect activities uh, which might need uh, attention by authorities or which might need attention uh, which might need uh, answering. So as you might understand, looking at these, uh, looking at the system, having to look at these multiple camera feeds and manually uh, understanding that is a tedious process, and uh, also leads and uh, and also a, uh, a reason for uh, and it also leads to uh, human error. So there is a need for a technology which can automate this surveillance process to be able to go through these video feeds and recognize the activities that are happening in these videos uh, to help automate. So the system that we have developed is, is such a system. It's called it's for real-time active detection security videos. On the left, I'm showing you a couple of videos uh, on which our system uh, we are showing the output from our system. 
the system that we have developed is a computer vision artificial intelligence artificial intelligence based system for activity detection by humans so it, the input to our system is an, a long untrimmed security surveillance video and the, the what we want to do is we want to localize all the activities and classify the activities that are happening in these video feeds as you may understand, this is a very challenging problem as there could be multiple activities happening in these videos and there could be multiple actors associated with each of the activities. And there could be multiple interactions that are happening between people which, which might make the activity detection very complicated. So what makes our system different from existing systems is existing uh, uh, security uh, surveillance systems, they recognize the objects in the camera feed. For example, they can recognize that there's a person and there is a vehicle, but they don't really recognize that there is an Active, what kind of activity is being performed uh, by that person or, or what, what the vehicle is doing. So there are uh, activity detection systems specific to some specific scenarios. For, uh, for example, there are activity detection systems for uh, if there is, uh, for example, uh, inside, inside the cars to recognize if the person, if the driver is attentive or not, or in, uh, in uh, manufacturing sector where the, it recognizes activity is done by a uh, worker but not uh, a system which can recognize activities in the world. So this system was developed as part of a, a IARPA project called DIVA, which, sat, which stands for Deep Intermodal Video Analysis. And the objective of this program was to develop this real-time deep learning based system to do uh, automated uh, video analysis. So the, our system runs at a speed of 100 frames per second, which is much faster than the real-time requirements, so which was uh, part of the IR pro pro program. On the left, I am showing you a chart uh, where uh, we are comparing the performance of our system with other teams and other uh, uh, universities which part which competed with us in this program. As you see, we perform much better than other com other universities like UMD, uh, MIT, and Purdue, and also companies like IBM uh, and so on. So we filed a patent for our technology and currently it's pending. Apart from that, we have won this IRPA program, DIVA IRPA program. We are the winners of the phase two and phase three systems. And when we published our work in the peer reviewed conference, we also received a best scientific paper award, award for that. And apart from that, we also won uh, multiple challenges in, uh, uh, in the computer vision conferences. So the, uh, this system can be used for uh, different customer segments. The first one would be law enforcement. So it can be used for traffic management or body cam analysis of, uh, of uh, security personnel, or it can be used in commercial establishments like airports, theme parks, shopping malls, and so on to recognize activities uh, for, such as theft, arson, or uh, a, a robbery, or any anything uh, that, that is of interest. So currently we have demonstrated our technology on security camera feeds. These are the videos that are provided by IARPA as part of the program. And we were able to show the performance on these videos. Uh, but to be able to commercialize this, we have to develop this, uh, this technology into an end-to-end -end software, which we can package and send, sell it to the end user and provide user controls and uh, provide interfaces to work with the system. Currently, we are in talks with a company called Sighthound, which uh, want to work, partner with us and to license this technology or uh, bring it to the market. Uh, we are in plans to come uh, in uh, uh, to go through the NSF Icor program uh, to kickstart the uh, kickstart our company, and also we are in talks with Disney, who are interested in our technology to automate the surveillance of their rights. Uh, our team includes myself and other two PhD students who worked on this problem, along with uh, Assistant Professor Yogeshwar Rawat and uh, Professor Mubarak Shah, who is a renowned computer vision uh, specialist uh, scientist uh, in the field. Uh, thank you so much, and looking forward to meet you, meeting you in uh, in the booth. All right, thank you very much for being here. Next up, we have chemical earmuffs and then e-skin displays. You are on deck and you are next. Sorry, uh, I see the slide from Kenko earmuffs. Um, I am not hearing any sound. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I'm just trying to turn on my camera, actually. Perfect. No worries. <laughs> just want to make sure that, yeah. It's just, okay, start video. Sorry about that. All good. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Mark Rutherford from Washington University School of Medicine. There are no approved drugs for prevention nor for restoration of hearing loss, which is usually permanent and highly prevalent among veterans and the American public. 
Today, I want to tell you about a drug we are developing to prevent noise-induced hearing loss in a program we call chemical earmuffs. Imagine you are one of the estimated 22 million American military and civilian workers with noisy occupations. Maybe you're a person who enjoys loud recreational activities. What if your physical protection is defective or insufficient, or if you're unable to wear it? Maybe it compromises situational awareness, or maybe because compliance on wearing physical protection is just low. What if you could take a pill to prevent damage from expected noise exposures? Or if you could take an injection to rapidly intervene in unexpected noise exposure? Prevention of hearing loss is critical for the greater than 1.3 million veterans who suffer from service-connected hearing loss, making hearing loss, including tinnitus, the number one claim out of a total of approximately $99 billion in annual disability payments, as published in the VA's annual benefits report for fiscal year 2020. There are several ways to estimate the market for hearing protection, like the market for earplugs, which is more than half a billion annually, or for hearing aids, which would be much greater. To estimate the annual US market for pharmacological prevention, if we consider the 22 million American military personnel and civilians with hazardously noisy occupations and the percentage of those that go on to develop hearing loss, there's an estimated annual domestic market of about $37 billion based on a cost of treatment of $35 per day. So let me tell you a little bit about our technology. <clears throat> in response to sound, sensory hair cells in the inner ear release glutamate onto the fibers of the auditory nerve called spiral ganglion neurons. We have learned through our research that noise trauma results in excess glutamate release. And this excess of glutamate produces excitotoxic damage to synapses by activating glutamate receptors called AMPA receptors. And we discovered that there are two types of AMPA receptors at cochlear synapses those that are permeable to excitotoxic calcium ions and those that are not. If we block both types of receptors, noise trauma would be prevented, but also the ear would cease to function. Now, the difference between those two types of receptors is the presence or absence of a, mo of a molecular subunit called GLU-A2. So what our small molecule therapy does is it targets only the calcium permeable GLU-A2 lacking AMPA receptors, which prevents excitotoxicity while preserving hearing ability during the protection. So systemic delivery of our lead compounds orally prevents hearing loss by protecting synapses while allowing hearing ability to be maintained. And if you'd like to look at the data together with me, please attend the booth. Uh, we're a team of academic researchers who are seeking corporate partnerships and seeking to identify anchor customers in the federal government. As neuroprotectants, as neuroprotectants, our compounds have applications beyond hearing protection. For example, we have efficacy data for prevention of neurodegeneration following stroke. With patents pending, our drug is the first antagonist that is selective for subtypes of AMPA receptors. Our technology readiness level is four. And development of our technology has been partly supported by the Department of Defense Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program, or CDMRP. In a new initiative in the past five years called the Hearing Restoration Research Program, or HRRP, we successfully completed level one funding, and we recently received level two funding to develop a drug for the warfighter. Level three funding includes a pilot clinical trial. So we're here for customer discovery so that development of our technology can be tailored to the specific requirements of the end user. We're here to find business partners to help license our technology. And I look forward to discussing further at our booth. So please stop by. Here's some of our sponsors and thanks for your attention. All right, thank you very much, Mark. Next thank up, you. we have eSkin displays and Apply Nano Femto, you are on deck.
Uh, I am Nagendra Nagarajiya, um, the CEO of uh, eSkin Displays. Uh, today I'm going to present something very exciting. Uh, it's an infrared uh, energy harvester. Um, so that can allow you to generate uh, power uh, 24 into 7, uh, day and night. So what is the problem? Uh, today, most of the power generated is through solar energy, and it's limited to the visible spectrum. And it's only generated when the sun is visible, only in daylight and good weather. The infrared uh, spectrum is completely untapped. 80% of the incident uh, light from the sun is absorbed and uh, re-emitted re as infrared radiation. Infrared radiation is nothing else but the heat that uh, you see or you feel. And uh, also the heat from steam turbines, industrial uh, emitters, metal, um, uh, all the things that you see as heat uh, is not used uh, today. So no energy generation in the night and waste heat is completely not used. So our solution is an uh, infrared graphene-based uh, energy harvester that can generate electrical energy 24 hours based upon uh, incident uh, IR radiation uh, day and night in bad weather. So the efficiency at the moment is uh, six percent uh, in the mid IR. Um, I've given the the, the range. Um, the heat generated by industrial equipment, steam turbines, machines can be harvested uh, back to regenerate the electrical energy. That means you can convert all the waste heat uh, from uh, even you know, when you generate uh, energy through solar, uh, the big solar farms, most of them actually um, uh, sometimes you know, they store this energy and they uh, reheat uh, using steam. So all of the heat from that uh, can be converted back into electrical energy, increasing the efficiency of uh, the solar farms. So how does it work? It's a thin film uh, that's graphene based. It converts incident IR radiation, that is heat, into electrical energy. So that means you can install this on buildings, you can spread it on the ground. And um, um, in the case of DOD, in the case of war, the first thing that the uh, enemy knocks out is all the power installations. So people go hide in bunkers. So that means you need um, some way to um, generate power because there's no power. The human body emits about 150 watts of heat. It's in the range of our harvester. The sun, the sun emits 1,000 watts per square feet, and um, steam turbines at 400 degrees uh, centigrade generates about 14 kilowatts of uh, um, heat. Uh, a thermal emitter in an industrial application can generate up to one megawatts of square uh, energy. That means all of this can be converted back into electrical energy. For I'm giving an example of uh, to charge an iPhone with our um, uh, device would, uh, it takes about five watts, about five hours to generate, um, uh, to power an iPhone. Um, and our um, device also generates about one watt optimally uh, using sunlight with a one meter by one meter film. So what are the differentiators? Um, at energy, higher energy conversion uh, efficiency outperforms any of the existing structures by a factor of 100. Um, the current IR energy harvesters are, have efficiency of less than 0.5%. And um, also the increase efficiency uh, can uh, go from 5% to maybe 20%. Uh, when solar was first invented, uh, the solar cell by Bell Labs, um, the initial efficiency was just 5%. Today, it's at upwards of 25% re reaching the maximum uh, possible uh, potential. And uh, the cost will be comparable uh, with uh, to conventional solar cells with volume. So use cases, uh, soldiers um, have all these wearable devices and uh, that can be powered by the body heat or from the sun or any other heat source. And um, power buildings, uh, devices, day and night, and any heat generated uh, can be converted back into electrical energy. So traction, we have an ongoing uh, current uh, DARPA project, uh, direct phase two, uh, for an uncooled uh, infrared detector camera. And uh, this has been added as an option phase uh, to, gen to look into infrared energy harvesting. We are also an NSN uh, participant. I look at our team. Uh, myself, uh, I'm the CEO of uh, the company. I've, uh, I'm a multiple, I've got multiple startup. I'm a serial entrepreneur. Dr. Devishish Chanda uh, is our uh, chief scientific officer and is an expert in the infrared uh, area. And Dr. Apostolos Wutsis, who's our uh, consulting advisor, and Rupa Rani, who's our program manager. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, 
the takeaways is energy can be convert, uh, generated uh, day and night on um, electrical energy. All the waste heat can be converted back into electrical energy. Thank you very much. Oh, and please join our room if you have more questions and also for demos and things like that. All right. Thank you very much. I got to say, everyone, y'all have been doing really great on time. Just saying. It's like five minutes on the dot for everyone. So uh, that's awesome. Um, cool. So last but not least, we have Applied Nano Femto. Hello. Um, I, uh, I need you to disable your screen sharing. So would you mind um, exiting your screen share? Okay. So, all right. Uh, does everyone see it? Yep. Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Michael. I'm with Applied Nano Femto Technologies, and I'll be uh, presenting on our work with uh, EMI Immune RF Photonic Links. We're based in uh, Lowell, Massachusetts. So RF Photonics is the technology used to transport microwave signals over optical fiber. And so this uh, technology sees a lot of use in electronic warfare. And so um, for the next generation uh, RF photonic receivers in these applications, uh, there are about three main um, desired qualities for these optical links. Um, um, first being uh, an immunity to electromagnetic interference, for example, in, uh, to prevent against uh, radar jammer, high, high power microwave uh, attacks. Uh, all of our components should be small in size, compact, and, uh, and the devices should be uh, also high performance enough to keep up with our advanced radar systems in the military. Um, so actually you can see here, we have a, um, you know, uh, our RF, uh, antennas um, will transport our signal down to the uh, command center. So I guess it kind of begs a question, okay, um, why photonics, I suppose, but um, well, compared to conventional RF electronics, um, there are some advantages. First of all, um, is the immunity. There's a natural immunity to electromagnetic interference with uh, optical fiber, just in glass. Um, but but uh, really one important uh, aspect of this is that there's much lower loss per distance um, compared to a, a standard RF cable. So really, if you have to basically transport your, your signal from you know, the top of, an, of a mast from your antenna down to your command center, you know, your, your signal, uh, your microwaves are toast, you could say. Um, but uh, there's also improved bandwidth and performance. So the ANFT solution is really to build a, an RF photonic receiver with EMI shielding that's powered by optical fiber, by, by, by um, light waves in optical fiber. So that also gives us a remote power supply that we can send, that we can power our device, our receiver to the antenna um, remotely. But um, so this is a, that, that type of architecture is not being worked on to our knowledge, uh, our current program, uh, as we understand, is the only of its type. Um, so these, uh, the EMI shielding will protect our electrical components. Um, as I stated also, the, uh, the optical power delivery um, enables and also Im improves our uh, EMI immunity. We can design this in a compact size um, using uh, semiconductor devices um, also. Um, and we also, we also uh, suspect that there are also commercial applications of this, just mainly for the flexibility of it, um, possibly for fiber backbones. And also there, um, we can also explore other, um, other types of photonic integrated circuits, perhaps uh, WDM. Um, we can also implement something like that in uh, future design. So at ANFT in Lowell, Massachusetts, we do semiconductor growth epitaxy. We do processing we design photonic devices, and we can also test our devices. So uh, we have an in-house MBE growth machine, and uh, we have experts in RF photonics and uh, with experience for EW applications. So here we have a, uh, our gallium arsenide PV cell 
and uh, our optical receiver, which is on Indian phosphide. Um, our technical team is uh, Dr. Shijun Mu, uh, who's a, an expert in photonic devices and MBE growth. Uh, Dr. Yifei Li, uh, an expert in RF photonics and photonic devices and RF systems, and myself uh, with background in RF photonics, fabrication and RF measurement. So we're looking for new funding sources uh, to uh, expand on our projects and our ideas. Um, and uh, so we also have uh, some previous um, previous collaborators and funding sources on the right side. And um, thank you for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to us and um, get in contact with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Michael. Um, go ahead and exit screen share. All right, well, so thank you to all six of our companies presented in this room. Um, hope uh, all of you in this room found um, something that was interesting or something worthwhile following up on, which is why um, we will now be uh, in just a short moment going to the third section of today's showcase, which is the Q&A, the booth section, um, whatever you wanna call it, but what you're gonna be able to do is Go back to the main you know, campus page, right? So in a moment, I'm gonna ask you all to exit your Zoom meeting, go back to your main campus page, and you can scroll down to the individual companies that you would like to meet with, right? Um, and you can meet with as many as you want. Go into their room, and there'll be a, another Zoom, like the two Zooms you've already joined, where you can talk directly with you know, the, the company that was presenting today. You have the opportunity to ask as many questions, look at their two-pager, ask for a two-pager, um, whatever you want. Um, so. That's, uh, that's what the third part of the today's showcase is gonna be about. One other small thing before I let you all go is when you return to the main room and as you're scrolling through which companies, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, there will be a survey. This survey would be really, really helpful for us if you could just take a brief moment to fill it out. If you are spending like multiple minutes on it, you are filling out the survey wrong. Um, it should be very quick. Um, just a quick thing to let us know, hey, what did you like about the format? Are we doing things that make sense for you so that in the future, other folks are also um, getting a lot of value out of these things? So are there any last minute questions um, for uh, everyone heads out to the booths? Thanks, Max. It, I think it went pretty smooth. I'm pretty impressed with this Philo thing. So I'm gonna recommend it. <laughs> Glad to hear that, yeah. Um, certainly uh, in the ye olden days, we used to do this, um, you know, without Philo, all on Zoom, and that was definitely a lot, uh, a lot, a lot of chaos. So yes, uh, companies, go ahead and join the um, Zoom in your rooms right away. Uh, everyone else, go ahead and float, and um, don't forget to take the survey, and see you all later. Thanks, everyone. Is there any help we may be able to provide to those folks still hanging on the line? For those of you that are still on the line, we will be closing this room in just a few seconds, minutes. Um, so yeah, but happy to answer any questions y'all might have. 